Okay, so tonight, Bezra Hashem, we're going to be continuing our series of Shirim and Rabbi Nachman and the possibility of joy. And tonight's Shir is going to be titled The Silliness of Being. And we're mamish going to be picking up exactly where we left off two weeks ago from the Shir of the art of not caring or learning not to care. We ended off with a statement from Rabbi Nachman in Chaim Haran that the world has always operated in this topsy-turvy type of way. The elyonim, that which we see as higher in truth should be lower. That which we perceive as lower should in truth be higher. And everything is mixed up and muddled up. But, Rabbi Nachman tells us, that throughout history there's always been one holy person, one tzaddik, one individual sitting at the bottom of the world and laughing at the world. And it's this schoik, it's this laughter at the world poking a hole in the seriousness of the world, which we're going to talk about tonight in terms of how Rabbi Nachman teaches us to be happy. And again, because each year is its own existence, what we have to start off with is the nature of what Simcha is for Rabbi Nachman. That Simcha is both the most difficult of all avoidas, the most non-apparent act of what it means to be a human being is to truly find happiness and joy in this world. Yet nevertheless, in the same breath, Rabbi Nachman tells us over and over how it's the most essential behavior that we have to try and uncover. So on the one hand, it's the most difficult. On the other hand, it's the most essential. And those two warring tensions between the nature of Simcha do not bother Rabbi Nachman. The fact that it's so difficult, the fact that it's so rare to find, the fact that it demands self-abandonment and acceptance and a surrender to the flow of what is, doesn't detract one iota of the necessity and the demand to find joy in each moment. And on the one hand, joy is something that is not yet present, that the world is not a place of simcha, the world is a place of chisaro, and the world is a place of difficulty and brokenness. Yet on the other hand, it's specifically in that territory of the opposite of simcha, that we have the ability to create simcha, to force simcha into the circle, to draw sadness into the circle of simcha to look at the world and all of the elements of the world that push Simcha away, and to say, nevertheless, it's specifically down here that my job is to find joy. And so we see this paradoxical tension within Rabbi Nachman that on the one hand, Simcha is representative of a wholeness that is not yet present. And the act of Simcha is drawing that future wholeness into the deficient present moment so that the deficiency of the present moment gets filled with wholeness. Now that wholeness that we draw down into the deficiency of this worldliness doesn't negate the brokenness as we've spoken about in the past. It's not simply satisfying a hunger or a craving as if the sadness was rooted in lack and happiness is rooted in fullness that follows and takes away lack. But rather the lack itself, the deficiency itself, this world itself is transformed into a site of wholeness in spite of the fact that it's still not whole. So that the dance of Simcha and the very delicate dance of Simcha is a dance of an awareness of a wholeness that is not yet present, but by being aware of the fact that it's not present, we believe in the fact that it will be present and that future hope towards Simcha is then drawn into the present moment itself. So we have to dig deep into this worldly experience to uncover the residual light of a future happiness. And that's what Simcha is on a certain level for Rabbi Nachman the ability to live as if things are whole in spite of the fact that things are broken. And we spoke last week about cultivating the act of not caring what the rest of the world is saying because the rest of the world looks at the outside. As Rav Kuk says, that most of the world is shikr b'chitzonius, is intoxicated on the externalities of how things appear, on the intelligible appearance of things without ever digging too deeply into the core of what's taking place. And the rest of the world judges and seeks to find reasons behind all of the feelings that they cultivate. And what Ibn Nachman was demanding of us, what Ibn Nachman was calling for, was an abandonment of care towards the other, towards the other's opinion, and a willingness to sacrifice, whether it's reputation on an external level, whether it's the need for rational awareness, and to throw ourselves deeply into the promise of Simcha in spite of the fact that it's not present yet. And this is how Rabbi Nachman laughed at the world. Rabbi Nachman saw a world where Simcha was almost an impossibility, where finding joy 
we're looking at the world and saying, Hashem, this world that you created is beautiful. This world that you created bears the mark of the creator. In a world where we can't say that, in a world where Simcha is not apparent, Rabbi Nachman called upon us and said, Hevra, the only way to get through this is with Simcha itself. And that's how we have to learn not to care. We can't care about the fact that Simcha is so far from the reality. We have to move deeper and move beyond caring to the Darga of Loich Patli Bechlal, to that Darga of Eretz Yisrael, when Rabbi Nachman was able to throw himself into all meaning and all forms of katnus and meaninglessness and to show that Simcha burgeons specifically there. Now there's another Eitza that Rabbi Nachman gives. And this is where Rabbi Nachman speaks about the need to act with foolishness in the service of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now very often, especially prior to Rabbi Nachman, the guiding principle of Aved Hashem was a rationality that understood exactly what was up, what was down, and what my job was as an individual. The crowning jewel of the intellectual prowess of the mind that was capable of grasping truths beyond itself was the mark of spiritual growth. In a certain derech of the Rambam, the idea was that the apex of the spiritual experience was to come to a point of knowledge, was to come to a point where, rationally speaking, I understood everything there was in my life, and I understood why I was doing what I was doing, and I stayed away from things that I didn't understand. What Rabbi Nachman initiated was a revolution against that drive towards rational awareness. Rabbi Nachman felt that the craving for rationality was a craving for control, ultimately. That which I know, that which I can grasp is something that I have a shlita over. I understand it. I stand under it and I hold it above myself and I'm in control of it. But according to that vision, in the loss of rationality, when things no longer make sense, so then a person is thrown back into chaos. Rabbi Nachman, as we said, went further than rationality. He marched down the entire imaginable pathway of spiritual growth, and he came to realize that at the end of the day, the apex of knowledge, the apex of spiritual experience is not rational understanding, but rather coming to a place where we acknowledge the limitations of what it means to be human and where we can look at the world and realize, ultimately, I have no idea about anything whatsoever. And the only thing left for a person is a simple childlike tamimus, a simplicity that accepts what we choose to believe in, in spite of the fact that we don't have evidence that supports it. This was Rabbi Nachman's revolution. Rabbi Nachman's re revolution was to crack, up, to crack up rationality, to laugh at it, to show the cracks in it, to reveal that in truth, this drive for the prowess of the human mind and control over our experiences in this world and the grasp of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is ultimately a pipe dream. And the only thing that we can do is to have a muna in HaKadosh Baruch Hu and to throw ourselves with abandonment. And because of this, on a certain level, Rabbi Nachman understood that simcha at times is going to be irrational, just like the world is irrational. And there are things that we see in the world which are irrational. And the more and more we try and understand why things happen here and why things happen there, the more and more we get caught up in the thicket of confusion and doubt, which ultimately leads to those kushios, to those existential antinomies that we have upon ourselves, upon other people, and upon HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The goal of the Yiddish Neshama is to be ma'avir, to dance over or to jump over all of those antinomies that rests at the heart of existence and to move to a place of simplicity in spite of all of the irrationality. And Rabbi Nachman said that sometimes in order to be besimcha, a person has to live in that foolishness. A person has to break free of the confines of the demand for the human being to be a rational thinking creature. And we have to ascend and transcend rational logic to a place of laughter and folly and silliness. Not a silliness, God forbid, that negates the quest for knowledge. Not a silliness that says everything is meaningless. Hevel havalim, I might as well not try and study anything. I might as well not try and know anything. But rather a silliness that transcends logic. For Rabbi Nachman teaches us, as he himself did, to learn everything there is, to become a bucky in everything that there is, to know everything, to go as deep as one can possibly and theoretically go. And then when a person hits the limit and a person feels overwhelmed by the limit that they're experiencing, 
to break on through to the other side and to reveal that beyond the limit of logic's fallacy rests a world of silliness and laughter and foolishness, or what Rabbi Nachman refers to as mile distusa. And in that place of imagination, in that field where the grass sings out to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and the shepherds sing out their song to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, there a person can suspend that drive for rational knowledge over things and live in a, a state of suspended rationality and laugh and to be silly and to say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I'm going to serve you with joy and gladness in spite of all of the rational reasons in the world to not be happy. I'm going to fight for joy in spite of the opposite of joy banging on my head at every second. And this is the seriousness of joy for Rabbi Nachman. Being foolish was a very serious matter for Rabbi Nachman because when a person walks the path of life and trying to center their minds with their intention and their das on the possibility of simcha, if a person loses focus for a second, they're going to fall into the sholtachtas. They're going to fall into the opposite of simcha. Rabbi Nachman was aware that the abyss yawned on both sides of that very narrow bridge, which is why the main thing is to not be afraid. That if I deviate ever so slightly from the delicate path of holy and sacred foolishness that rests beyond rationality, so I lose myself and I fall into marashchair, I fall into sadness when I see how irrational things are. So Rabbi Nachman wanted us to dance beyond rationality and to live in a place where we can make light of this world. Because this world, in all of its pain and suffering, as Rabbi Nachman points out so often, is almost too serious to take seriously. It's almost too serious for us to walk along the path of this world and taking every moment too seriously. A Jew has to uncover that place of schleik within their mind, that place of folly and laughter and silliness and the abandonment of the mind to say, in spite of the fact that I don't know anything, nevertheless, I am going to live according to my own narrative. Ah, you point out to me it's not true. Lo bakti b'chlal, I don't care. I laugh at your truth. I laugh at your truths. As Rabbi Nassim says, there's emes and there's emes la amiso. There's a truth in this world. There's the valid truths about existence, which we have to follow down to the deepest principle. But Rabbi Nassim says, what happens when that emes causes us marashchera? What happens when we follow the path of emes and we look at ourselves and our brothers and our world and the world around us and everything surrounding us and emes leads us to a path of brokenheartedness? So at that point, Rabbi Nelson says that a person has to cast away emes and connect to emes la amiso, to the truth that rests within the truth, which is the capacity of folly beyond rational logic, of choosing to act as if, choosing to pretend that we're happy and to act foolish for that happiness, to dance in spite of the fact that nobody has any idea how it's possible to dance, to raise ourselves ever so slightly above the ground through radical dancing, an abandonment of the self for the sake of drawing down lights of positivity that are so distant from what our mind's eye sees that we begin to believe in it because it's the secret of the personal narrative that Rabbi Nachman gives us access to. And Rabbi Nachman talks about this in, in great detail. What we're going to look at right now is we're going to look at the 49th teaching, the 49th teaching of Lakuta Maharan, where Rabbi Nachman ends as follows. He says as follows, and from everything that we've been discussing, a person will understand how deeply of a focus a person needs in order to ensure that they don't lose hope in themselves. Even if that which happens, happens. Again, that nondescript subjective experience of falling to wherever I have fallen. Like we've spoken about numerous times, Rabbi Nassim and Rabbi Nachman never specify what the failure is. They never give a proper name or an objective framework to what the fall is. Rather, it's a subjective kind of open-ended notion of yihia ma shihia. What is, is. What happens, happens. And each and every person is capable of applying their own human circumstances to those open phrases. The ha'ikar and the essential thing is to liyoz b'simcha tamid for a person to be joyous at all times, at all times, tamid. And here again, Rabbi Nachman is showing us 
what we're going to be seeing over and over that simcha, happiness, is not a mood that a person finds themselves in. It's a, sh a shape and a framework of mind that a person creates for themselves, which is why Rabbi Nachman can say that happiness is a choice at every moment. I don't fall into happiness. I act as if I'm happy until I become happy. The afilu mile And even through acts of foolishness, la asos atzmo keshota, to make oneself out as if they're a fool. To act in foolish, ridiculous ways, to jump and to dance, in order that one may come to Simcha. Now, obviously, there are a number of ways of understanding this that the mile dishtusa, these acts of foolishness, can be seen as external gestures that a person engages in so as to create an aura of simcha in the world, which is certainly something that is found within the trajectory and the history and the development of certain sects of Tamidim and Tamidim of Tamidim in Breslov, where there's dancing and kvitsos and music in spite of all of it, and all a person can do is dance in spite of everything. But then there's another way of looking at this, which is that the inyane deshtusa, acting like a fool, is not about us and the rest of the world, but about us and ourselves. That very often the main impediment to simcha, as Rabbi Nachman points out, is our own minds, are the machshavos zaros that we experience, those foreign thoughts that draw up the clouds and confusion and despondency and sadness and failure into our minds. And a person can, God forbid, be miyayish. A person can look at the track record of their lives, at the rap sheet of their lives, and they can come to a place of yayush saying that simcha is an impossibility over here. There's too many things that I've lost. There are too many things that are irretrievable. Or if a person's anxiety is future-centric, then it's the fear that even if I build something, it's going to fall apart. If I look to the right, if I look to the left, if I look to the past or to the future, for many people, simcha is a pipe dream, which is why Rabbi Nachman is saying that we have to even create mile deshtusa within ourselves. We have to ignore those negative self-thoughts that tell us that simcha is not something we deserve and to force ourselves, to compel ourselves into simcha, to ignore the rational thoughts that we have and to dance at home and to sing at home, and to be silly, and to not take things too seriously, and to be able to recognize that my avodas Hashem is so essential and so serious that I need to be able to laugh with Hashem. It's not enough for me to follow each and every rule in order to make sure that I feel I'm doing what I need to do in the eyes of others. Adarabah, I have to reach that darga of lo yichbati b'chlal. It doesn't matter to me. And the main thing is to connect to HaKadosh Baruch Hu with joy by laughing with Hashem, by being in on the joke with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, as we're going to see. Because as Rabbi Nachman teaches us so often, the world on a certain level is a joke, which is why the tzaddik sits at the bottom laughing at it. Now that's not, God forbid, to negate the value of the world, but it's to teach us a pathway of understanding how to be mitmoded with the world. When a person looks into the core, into the heart of Jewish theology, of Kabbalah, of Pnimiya Satora, as described in the works of Tzadikim, and in particular Rabbi Nachman and Torah Samach Dalid, what a person confronts when you learn deeply enough into any sugya is the paradox that rests at the heart of it all. The deepest paradox being the paradox of God's absence and presence operating in unison. Because as we know, in order for HaKadosh Baruch Hu to create the world, he had to be mitzamsim himself. Because the annihilating light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's infinite presence saturated all space, and there was no room for anything other than godliness. And therefore, our tzaddikim teach us God needed to contract himself in order to create a void devoid of God where creation could exist. But on the other hand, Rabbi Nachman points out, we know that nothing can exist without the animating light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And the notion of an absence of the infinite light is, is a logical fallacy. So here we're stuck at the crossroads of God's absence being of absolute necessity and God's presence being of absolute necessity. And instead of settling that paradox, Rabbi Nachman says, Kacha, this is the secret of Tzimtzum, how it's full and empty at once, how it's presence and absence at once. And this is the secret of Yitzchak Avinu. This is the secret of the laughter of Yitzchak who's able to look at those paradoxes and realize that at the heart of all things, there's a, there's a paradox that causes us to laugh, to look at the world and say, Baruch Hu, this is silly, we know you're still here. 
we know that you've never been apart from us for even a second. And Mile Dishtusa, acting like we're in on the joke, acting for Hashem, pretending for Hashem, being foolish for Hashem, is acknowledging the fact that, yes, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we're going to live our lives as if you're absent, as if this world is separate from you. Even though deep down we're all in on the joke, we know you're here still. And we're laughing like good friends, we're laughing about it. That's the Mile Dishtusa the willingness to dance for HaKadosh Baruch Hu in spite of the fact that the world looks like a place that is devoid of dancing. That's the light of Yitzchak Avinu. That's the light of Rabbi Nachman, who we were told that on his way to Eretz Yisrael, when he throws himself into that profound level of concealment, he called himself Yitzchak. And somebody came to Rabbi Nassim once and said, I want to name my child after Rabbi Nachman, but I also have a grandfather whose name was Yitzchak, who I would like to name my child after. And Rabbi Nassim answered that it's better to name him Yitzchak because Rabbi Nachman's name was also Yitzchak. Because on a certain level, Rabbi Nachman came to teach us about this joke. Rabbi Nachman came to teach us how to laugh at the world. Rabbi Nachman came to teach us how the world was so serious that the only way to function is by acting lighter by laughing, by not taking things too seriously, by taking things in stride, by not taking ourselves too seriously, by not holding ourselves to standards beyond what we're capable of, but to laugh with ourselves, to laugh with ourselves and to recognize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is with us even when we're laughing at ourselves. Describing the nature of Mile Deshtusa, <clears throat> Rabbi Nachman writes as follows, and this is in Chaye Maharan, Os Taf Kuf So we're 593. So Rabbi Nachman, when he talks about how difficult Simcha is, how profoundly difficult it actually is, he describes as follows. He says, with regards to me and my Avedis Sashem, he says, I can't ever relax my demand that Hashem has for me. And saying that even though I've accomplished things, I have to always keep another eye on what I haven't accomplished yet. So even when I'm in a state of fullness, says Rabbi Nachman, I have to understand what's still missing. Aval lachem, Rabbi Nachman says, but for you guys, ain't srichim lo marzos. You don't have to go that far. Ki atem srichim lios besim chatamid. You need to be happy all the time. Meaning to say that your position in Avoid the is different than mine. Even in my state of fullness, I have to remember lack. For you, however, for those of you who are not me, you have to remember wholeness even in a state of lack. You have to draw yourselves towards simcha at every moment. That you shouldn't feel like there's more for me to do because that leads to marishchayr and that leads to despondency and that leads to a person being overwhelmed. But rather a person should find points of joy, things to give themselves life, the tiny elements of goodness that exist within us. Those nekudos tovos that we uncover within ourselves, those are the points of happiness that I'll call upon him. Nevertheless, there's always something good with me. The al pirov, but because simcha is so difficult sometimes, generally speaking, the only way we can make ourselves happy is through mile dishtusa, through words of foolishness. La'asos inyane schoik v'milsa debedichusa k'de l'samech atzmo b'bad efshar to make light of our situation, to be able to laugh at it, to joke with ourselves and to joke with HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and to not take it all so seriously in any matter that we can. And because the nature of the world is the way that it is, very often natural joy is the hardest thing to come upon. So most of the time we have to pretend, we have to act as if we're happy. We have to smile even when we don't want to smile. We have to give people gracious responses even when we don't want to. We have to sit and listen to what other people have to say even if we don't want to listen to them. That's the acting. That's the mile deshtusa. That's the pretending. That's the act that we're all playing for our Kaddish Baruch Hu. Why? Because in truth, the strongest force in this world is despondency and sadness. And it strengthens itself upon a person throughout every day. The kasha l'shabr yotar mikol amidos, and it's more difficult to break than any other mida. Umazekas laadam meoid yotar mehakol, and this sadness and despondency and this existential quandary that we find ourselves in when we look at the world and all of its nastiness and all of its ugliness is the hardest thing for a person to break. Al kain srichim lirois l'sameach etzatz me bechol hakoyches bechol madefsher. 
And therefore, a person needs to force themselves into joy with every strength that they have within themselves. Even when it's the opposite, even when I have absolutely no reason to be besimcha, both on a physical level or on a spiritual level. Whether it's with regards to the sustenance of the soul or the body. Nevertheless, in spite of it all, a person has to have trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Again, trust in HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the very same trait as Simcha, right? Because Bitachon is a trust in a future that has not yet arrived. The same as Simcha is a joy in wholeness that is still not present. That in the end of the day, we know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is not going to leave us forever. And and we need to strengthen ourselves with even the slightest residual hope of laughter within ourselves to elevate us up towards Simcha. The Havain Devarim Elu and understand these words very well, says Rabbi Nassan, Ki Divre Rabbeinu Zechronim Lebrachahim Amukim Maod. Remember these words about Mile Dishtusa very, very well because they're incredibly and exceedingly deep. And the depth of the depth is to follow these words with deep simplicity. And even though it appears afterwards that we go against what we're pretending to do, nevertheless, even a moment of simcha is worthwhile. This is what Rabbi Nachman is teaching us, that a person has to throw themselves into abandonment, to stop caring so much about how things look on the outside and to move inwards and to recognize that if I am going to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu, it has to be within my own mind, my own heart, and my own body. And if I'm not feeling good, I have to make myself feel good. Nothing else is going to come to make me feel good. Simcha is not going to drop out of Shamayim unless I awaken the Simcha within myself. Simcha is a koach. It's a magnetic force that draws down iris of Simcha. But I have to first and foremost be besimcha. Ki besimcha teitzeu. I have to create simcha. I have to pretend to be besimcha. And it's ultimately this pretending and this acting as if, which can be described as Rabbi Nachman's deepest truth about acting foolishly. Because it's an inion of acting. It's an inion of pretending. It's an inion of being in a play. It's an inion of recognizing that the game is rigged, yet we're still in it. Because we know ultimately that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to finish everything. We know ultimately that Gamarti Egmor, I will finish, and I have finished already, Nitzachti Vanatseach, Hashem will be victorious, and Hashem is always victorious. We know how it ends. We know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is present at every moment. Yet at the same moment, we live in a Hester Kafulum Chupal. We live in a concealment that is concealed, even its own concealment. And our job is to be in the game, to act in this play for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, with the knowledge on the one hand that Hashem is present at every moment, with that grin on our faces, that v'tishak Macharun grin of our tzaddikim, those tzaddikim who understand the future is present even in the present. And at the same moment, we have to pretend that everything is incredibly serious. We need to be able to hold that paradox, which is the birthplace of laughter, which was what Yitzchak Avinu was all about. That capacity to laugh, because even though everything looked so severe, he was so unbearably aware of the fact that HaKadosh Baruch Hu was present in every moment. And it's this paradox of acting as if we don't know Hashem is there, and at the same point, understanding intuitively that Hashem is there, that gives us permission to act in Mile Dishtusa, to act for HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And this is what Rabbi Nachman says in a famous teaching, in the 51st teaching in Sikha Saran. Rabbi Nachman again teaches us to laugh at this world, to not take this world so seriously. This world is absolutely nothing. The only purpose is to direct oneself to the essential goal. A person shouldn't worry too much about their financial situation. Because on a, a level of equality, everything is going to go to the dust anyway. This world deceives us completely. That it appears to a person that we're earning and we're earning and we're growing and we're growing. And in the end, it's revealed to us that we have absolutely nothing. Rabbi Nachman says as follows. That's true in this world. And it's also true in terms of Avodah Hashem. La Avodah Hashem, to serve God. 
Eini yodea mihu sheyachalomer sheyavod es Hashem. I don't know if there's anybody who is capable of saying that they truly serve Hashem. Lefi gedula sabore es parach. According to the true greatness of Hakadosh Baruch Hu. Mi yodea maat megalusi es parach. Eini yodea ech yachalomer sheyavod es parach. Because someone who knows a little bit about the greatness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu should also know that it's an impossibility to claim that a person has even begun to serve Hashem. Because there's no Malach and there's no Saraf who has ever been able to self engradize themselves to claim that they've served Hashem. Raka Iker Hu Haratzon, but rather the essence is the desire and the cultivation of desire. Liyotz Ritzono Chazak V'takif Tamid L'Skari V'Lav That our desire and our yearning and our craving to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu should be real at every moment. And even though everybody in truth is craving to serve God, not all forms of desire are equal. And here is where Rabbi Nachman says something just absolutely remarkable. And in truth, according to the greatness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Kol elu ha'avodos, all service of Hakadosh Baruch Hu, enam klum, are in truth not considered to be anything. Rak ha'kol hu b'derech ke'ilu, but rather everything is on a level of as if, of pretending, of mile deshtusa, of being silly with Hashem. Ki ha'kol hu kamo schoik be'alma kenege gablusa yisbarach, because everything in truth is considered one great comedy in the eyes of Hakadosh Baruch Hu's greatness. That's the avoda to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu in spite of the fact that we understand that we can never truly serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu. To live in this world with a seriousness and a sobriety of how intense it is, but at the same point to have the grin of Mile Deshtusa on our faces that realizes that it's all a bidichusa, it's all a joke, it's all one big joke that we're trying to uncover the laughter of HaKadosh Baruch Hu that rests at the core of everything. And the way that we can bring about the end of the joke for Hashem to reveal the punchline on a certain level of v'tischak le'om acharon is showing Hashem that we know we're acting. It's mile deshtusa, we're pretending for you, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There's many stories in Sipori Maisios that speak about this, but one of the essential places is in the Maisa of the Adam Sha'avad Betit, the person who spent his time digging in the mud. It's an incredibly beautiful short story from Rabbi Nachman, where he tells of a poor man who made his money from searching out things in the dirt. And he spent all of his time digging and trying to find something until finally he found, in a state of desperation, a beautiful diamond. And this diamond was so beautiful that everyone who saw it said, there's no one with enough money to buy it from you here. You have to go to London. So he sold everything he could in order to try and get a ticket. And even then he didn't have enough money. So he went onto the ship and he showed the captain of the ship this beautiful diamond. The captain of the ship said, clearly this is a rich person. Clearly this is a person who has insight. I'm going to let him onto the ship. And they put him in first class. And this person knew he didn't belong in first class, but he started feeling good about it and so on and so forth. And every day this Jew would sit with a window looking out to the sea and every time he ate, he would sit with that diamond in front of him. And because it would gladden him and it would bring him joy and he would laugh with it. And one time he leaves it on the table and the waiter comes in and he throws out this diamond. And so this Jew realizes that he's in a lot of trouble. Because when the captain finds out, not only is he going to want his life for the money that he didn't pay for a ticket, but there was no reason anybody needed him anymore. He had a lot of pain. And he nearly lost his mind. What am I supposed to do now that I've lost everything I had? The captain of the ship is a thief. He'll kill me for the ticket price that I can't pay. Therefore, what did this honey do? What did this cement digger, this mud digger do? He made himself glad and joyous as if nothing at all happened. And every day the captain would come to his room to speak to him. And when the captain returned to him, he didn't see any difference at all. 
and he saw that nothing has changed with this person and that he was still as happy as possible. The story continues that the captain, knowing that this person was a rich person, he asks him insight into a dealing with wheat that he had to sell in London, and he transferred all of the wheat to this poor individual's name, and the captain passes away, and this Jew has all of the wealth and the riches. But the ikker of the story, as Rabbi Nelson points out, is that it was only through acting as if absolutely nothing changed, even though everything changed, even though everything fell apart and everything had no reason to create any semblance of joy anymore. He made it out as if absolutely nothing had happened and he held steadfast onto the simcha that was not dependent on anything external other than the mind. That's the simcha. That's the simcha of Mile Deshdusa, to act like a fool to pretend for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, to throw myself into the mud and roll around in this world for the sake of Hashem, to make this world lighter for myself, to take it less seriously. As Rabbi Nachman told his Hasidim, misham, when you leave me, etchem, and they ask you, Ma pa'altem, what did your Rebbe do? What did you find by your Rebbe? What was so important that you were willing to give up everything to connect to him? Taimu ruach. Say that you were taught how to breathe. You were taught how to be lighter. You were taught how to take this world just a little bit less seriously and to sit at the bottom in the corners of this worldly experience and to laugh at the world. And through that laughter to elevate ourselves and to bring ourselves into that shtus de kedusha. Now we do have to pay attention to the fact that very often shtus is considered a silly thing. Shtus is considered a negative thing. That severity and seriousness and that sobriety of what it means to be a mindful individual is very often the demand of the hour. So how could it be that it's specifically mile deshtusa that bring us joy? So here we have to look at the words of Rabbi Nassim because what Rabbi Nassim understood is that when Rabbi Nachman says serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu through mile deshtusa, he wasn't just saying that this is a mechanism that can bring out joy within the person, that if you act foolish enough, or if you suspend your logic enough, you'll be able to bring about joy. But Rabbi Nassim is Magdish, what Rabbi Nassim focuses more on is that it is specifically within shtus itself, within foolishness and silliness itself, that a person is meant to uncover simcha. Because it's one thing to be the sameach when the world is going well. But it's specifically in those meaningless encounters and that excess and that laughter and that meaningless cackle of the human experience in that nearly nihilistic laughter of this worldliness where a person looks at the world and said it's worth nothing. It's specifically there that a person has to uncover simcha. Rabbi Nassim is teaching us that when Rabbi Nachman says, Shtus de Kedusha, when Rabbi Nachman says, serve me with, serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu with Mile de Shtusa, he's not saying, this happens to be a tool. He's saying specifically within the shtus of this world, in this world, in the mud, in that place where no logic has any say anymore, it's specifically there that a person could be miskaber to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu with strength. It's specifically there in the repesh and the tit and rolling around like a fool that we can learn how to laugh properly. That's where the joke is found. That's where the laughter is found. What I want to end tonight's shir with there's a keta from the Zohar HaKadosh, which connects very much to this teaching of Rabbi Nassim, that it's specifically in this sikhlus, in this foolishness, in this bedicha, in this making fun, in this laughter, in this loss of meaning that a person is meant to serve HaKadosh Baruch Hu, when they give up on the quest for rational wisdom and they give in to the abandonment of the mind towards a space beyond rationality, it's specifically there that we're capable of uncovering the depth of the light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. <clears throat> The Zohar HaKadosh says as follows. V'tanya, v'ra'isi anishi yesh yisro nechachma menasichlos. So the Zohar HaKadosh in Parshas Tazria on Daf Mem Zayin Amid Beis says as follows based on the Pasuk in Kohelas. I have found that there is a benefit or there is an ascendancy towards wisdom above foolishness. And what the Zohar says is don't look at it as if wisdom is stronger than foolishness, but rather the strength of wisdom comes specifically min hasichlus mamish. It comes about through foolishness itself. Min hasichlus mamish asi alto It's specifically from within foolishness that the ascendancy of wisdom takes place. 
de almalle loi ashkicha de almalle loi ishtache khstusa ba alma for if there was no foolishness or silliness in this world loi ishtamuda khakhmasa ba miloi there would be no space or no benefit towards wisdom vataina khiyuva albarnaf de oilif khakhmasa le mail of zeir min stusa limindala there's a command that someone who is studying or teaching wisdom has to also know comedy they have to know foolishness they have to know how to laugh begin the asi tai alta le khakhma begina because there is a benefit and an ascendancy towards the light of wisdom that emerges specifically out of foolishness kama da asya te alta le nahura me khashukha just as there's a benefit and an increase and a potentiation of light specifically when it comes through darkness the almalle khashukha la yastamud nahura for if i never knew darkness i would never know light walay asi te alta la alma mine and there would be no benefit to light without darkness taina shiyesh yisra in khakhma there's a benefit to khakhma why is there a benefit to khakhma amar rabbi shimon rabbi aba ta khazi come and see raz de milo le nahir khakhma sidu le ela de nahir ela begin stusa the only reason that there's wisdom and light in this world is in order for us to understand foolishness the entire may asr akhra that emerges from another place the al malay hani hiru verabu sagir viyasav le havi and if it was not for the light of foolishness then the light of wisdom would be limited layat khazi ta alta khakhmasa and we would not find any benefit towards wisdom we begin stusa and it's specifically because of stus is na here yasir when here in lay yasir it's specifically through foolishness that we reveal the light in a more intensified way have you dekhsev this is what the pasuk means she is yisrain lakhma lakhma stam min asikhla stam that sikhlas that foolishness gives birth to a more intensified form of wisdom the kahlatata and so too down here el malay lay have stusa shakh ba alma if there was no foolishness found in the world lo have khakhma sa shakh ba alma there would be no wisdom or insight in the world bahinu darav him nuna saba and this is the tradition of rav him nuna saba the tzaddik said oilam kad have yalfin mine khavraya razid khakhma sa when he would teach the khavraya the secrets of wisdom have masader kaime pirke de mile de stusa he would teach them laughter and foolishness as well begin the ay say ta alta khakhma sa beginayu because it's specifically out of foolishness that the light of intellect is born we have to be willing to abandon the light of the mind and to rest and to dwell within the space of foolishness and when we allow ourselves to act like an evad for akadush baruchu an evad who does exactly what they're told whether or not they agree whether or not they see value in it and to act and continue acting and to laugh with akadush baruchu to be megala that targa of vitishak liyom acharon Be'ezer Sashem, what we're going to talk about next week is once we understand what Mili Dishtusa are, we're going to see how, based on what Rabbi Nassim describes, this gives us a koyach, willing to laugh at ourselves and to laugh with HaKadosh Baruch in this world, gives us a koyach, a cognitive koyach of how to deal with all of the thoughts of Marish Chayra that attack us, with all of those difficult thoughts of despondency that attack us, because if we can learn to laugh at those thoughts, and we can learn to disregard them and ignore them, that they're like the dust of the earth, so then we're able to simply push away the negative thoughts of our mind and regain control over the Iker Tachlis, which is to find Simcha in this world, Be'ezrus Hashem.